around the world. Really excited to have with us here today, you see on the screen myself, I'm Garrett Pachtinger, we have Justine Lee, and we have Janine Moga, who is our Vecral Chief Happiness Officer. Today, we're gonna to be talking about taming anxiety, biohacks to reduce overwhelm in an overwhelming time. And this certainly, I think, would classify as an overwhelming time. Uh, as we do on many of our YouTube lives, I am checking in as I look out my window from a sunny and humid Philadelphia area. Um, Justine, what about you? It is a beautiful 83 degree day in uh, the Twin Cities and can't complain. Winter is coming. So. <laughs> and Janine, what about you? Uh, muggy, hot, coastal Virginia. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on the, the muggy side of things. So if, I, I would love to have everybody, if you could, while we just wait a minute or two to really get started with our talk today, if you can type in where you are um, signing in from around the country, around the world, we would love to know where you are are, are from right now. And we, uh, we love seeing our guests from you name it. I mean, all the way West Coast in California, East Coast to where I'm in Philadelphia, Puerto Rico, Europe. Um, we love seeing seeing and getting notes from everyone around the world. And so in just one minute, we will get started because we know everyone is is clocked on time and we, we value and appreciate you being here. While we are doing our uh, uh, check-in, so again, please let us know where you're typing in. I'm going to start our introduction because I want to get to the, the heart of the lecture today and have our Chief Happiness Officer, Janine, give us all the great information. As I see coming in, Lisa from Vancouver, um, Oceanside near San Diego, Olivia from Noblesville. So yeah, all over the place. Sylvia near, near Philadelphia, Penn University, awesome. So again, thank you all for being here, talking about taming anxiety. Now, if this is your first Vecral event, what you will quickly notice is that we are the tech savvy way to get your online continuing education. Really, it's a multimedia approach in a very cost effective way. Uh, most commonly, we give webinars. Webinars, just like now, are a little bit longer, usually one to two hours. Uh, we give over 100 hours of new CE each and every year for a very cost-effective price for an individual veterinarian, $249 for a rolling calendar year. So if you signed up today, the middle of August, I think it's the 10th or so, you'd be good until August 10th next year. We have discounts for interns, residents, new graduates and veterinary technicians. We always offer complimentary memberships to veterinary students that are actively enrolled, veterinary technician students that are actively enrolled and any former or active military. So make sure you go to our membership page to check that out. Everything we do give that's live, we're giving a live session now, goes into our on-demand library afterwards. So as a member, 24 seven, 365, you can go back at any time and watch our content. But it can even be more cost effective, as I talked about our price for individuals before, our team plan. So for example, if five people sign up together, the price automatically drops to about 120 a person, 10 members or more, $99 a person. It's really a cost effective way to get that amount of CE live and interactive, as well as have access to our massive on-demand library. But we do more than webinars. We have podcasts or podcasts or audio files that you listen to. You can download them on any device, whether you use your Apple podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, radio.com, Stitcher, just search Vecral. We really are on most podcast platforms. And then I have two exciting announcements. The first is if you have not heard, we have our Vecral certificate program. So it's a great way. We offer basic and advanced ER, practice management, and nutrition. So we have a subset of great content. We, when you complete all that content, you get a dedicated certificate to yourself that's mailed to you, a vet girl certificate in X, Y, or Z. So we have four that we've already announced and we have more that are coming up. This is not an extra charge as a vet girl member. This is a value add. This is part of your membership. Another great reason that you should be a vet girl member. And then finally, we are now a CE management system. So whether you get your CE on Vecral or whether you get your CE on anywhere else, we always know we lose our CE certificates. You put them in a folder, in a drawer somewhere, and then a year from now, you're like, darn, I have no idea where that is. Well, no matter where you get it, you can upload it to the Vecral platform. It is date ordered. You can see on my screen here, the title you list, the speaker you list, the race provider, everything is there in chronological order so you never have to worry about finding a certificate. You can download it whenever you need it. So make sure you check out our CE management system. And then finally, logistics, okay? 
This is not race approved. This is one of the, the very limited sessions we are not doing race approval for live and interactive because we really wanted to have Janine come online and talk ASAP, not wait for race approval. This is a really important topic for everyone, all of our members and all of the veterinary community out there. We're dealing with a lot of challenging times right now, a lot of anxiety in ourselves, our clients. So we really wanted to get Janine online. This is her specialty, talking about um, this type of content. We really appreciate Janine being here. Justine is with me here behind the scenes as well. We'll be answering questions during and after. So we we hope you enjoy this as sort of a value add, something that Vecro loves giving back to the community, an incredibly important topic. And with that, um, Justine, I don't know if you have anything else you would like to, to add, but I'm going to go ahead and drop myself out shortly, and I'm going to have Janine continue and take it away. Janine, if you could give us a little background as well, um, sort of who you are, where you are, what you do, and then uh, we'll leave that floor to you. The floor is yours. But thank you so much for being here and delivering this amazing content. So important. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. And hi, everybody. I'm really grateful that you've taken some time out of your very, very busy days just to press the pause button. We're going to be talking about anxiety. Um, my name's Janine. I am a veterinary social worker, a licensed clinical social worker. My specialty is working with animal professionals um, around occupational well-being and also working with all the other human issues that crop up in veterinary practice. And I've been working with veterinary teams for um, about 17 years. So it is a great privilege for me to be spending some time with you today. Um, what we really want to do now is drill down and talk about how to better manage what's going on in this absolutely ridiculous time. So it goes without saying that we are in unprecedented sort of crisis right now. And it's been not just something that we thought was going to go on for a couple months, and then we'd be able to get back to normal, right? Because this is prolonged exposure to chronic strain, complete uncertainty. And we are being asked every single week to punt and figure it out. And that leads um, most of us to feel like we are constantly having to battle the sort of constant worry of wondering what's coming around the next corner. So my objectives very quickly today, I want to give you a little bit, very brief, of a background on the neurobiology of chronic anxiety and the opposite state, which is calm, related to the chronic stress, particularly what we're going through at the moment. Then I want to introduce something very briefly to you on vagus nerve stimulation. I really strongly believe if you understand your own physiology and you understand your hardware, you're in a better position to manage it. So we're going to go through that very quickly today. And then I really want to spend most of our time talking about sort of what can I do to manage the worry that is always here. And even if it's not focal for you right now, I'm guessing it's usually sort of scrolling in the background constantly at least it is for me at times like this. So I'm going to try to give you some very concrete ways to work with that, to try to manage that anxiety so it's not getting in your way, okay? So that's how we are going to proceed. So I want you to know one thing, the more we worry, the better we get at it. So anxiety is a normal emotional state. It actually is very closely related to fear, which is one of the the six core emotional experiences that human beings have. And fear and anxiety come from the perception of danger and risk, okay? So we are hardwired to pay attention to anything in our environment that could be introducing danger and risk to ourselves or those who are important to us. And we also have some part of the brain that really, um, privileges negative information over positive or neutral information. This is called the negativity bias. So if you've ever wondered why you instantly pay more attention to bad things than good, this is why. This is because your hardware is constructed in a way to keep you safe, right? So anxiety comes from a place that is necessary. We need to have anxiety in our lives. The challenge with anxiety is that it becomes a feedback loop. And so the more we worry, the better we get at it. And actually the act of worrying and the kind of behaviors that we put in place, some of you might be a little OCD as perfectionists, right? As we behave in ways that sort of support the anxiety, most of the time it's because we're trying to make the anxiety go down and it actually goes up. So this is the feedback loop that makes it really difficult for us to interrupt that anxious state, okay? And furthermore, 
sort of the constant influx of daily worries and frustrations, if we don't find a way to discharge some of these lower level anxious moments, what happens is that we have a chronic state of sympathetic nervous system activation, and that leads to oxidative damage. And over time, this is why anxiety is so problematic. It just makes it really hard for us to manage. So what we really need to do is to find a way to frame it for ourselves so that we can understand it. And when we understand it and can put our finger on what's going on for ourselves, is that self-awareness piece, we can manage it more effectively. So one of the ways to do this, I believe, is to think about it in terms of the triune brain. So the human brain is a triune brain or a three-part brain. Um, the reptilian or the really, really old brain is the alert center. This is where you have your, your amygdala. Okay, and this is where sort of the core functions, the fight, flight, flee, flee, fidget response comes in. So it's the four Fs, not the two. It's not just fight or flight. Um, this is where this comes up, and this is where we mobilize in order to respond to something that's potentially dangerous, okay? But beyond that, in the middle of the brain, we have the emotional midbrain, and this is where um, our mammalian center, this is emotions and memory, and they all sort of get clumped together. So um, all of the core emotions sort of arise here, and they can go both up and down. They can feed down into the lizard brain or the reptilian brain. They can also go up. And this is where we try to regulate that emotional response a little bit. That is the neocortex or the rational brain, okay? This is where we have self-awareness, emotional management, language, critical decision-making and reasoning, all of that happens in the lid, the very top of your brain. The, the challenge with chronic anxiety, and that is what we are all living in right now, is that it scrambles your signals and it leads to complete cognitive overwhelm. And so this can really make us feel more reactive. I don't know about any of you, but I know in really high anxiety days, my fuse gets really short. I start getting super snappy. The things that used to bother, that didn't used to bother me, begin to bother me. Um, and that's when I know that anxiety is starting to drive the train. And this is going to be an issue because I'm not taking in information anymore, at least not successfully. I'm probably not integrating it appropriately. And it's going to make being calm and centered and a really good critical thinking decision maker hard for me. And let's remember that all of that is really important for our personal and professional performance. So when we become super anxious and that becomes a chronic instead of a fleeting state of mind, we tend to default to one of two ways of functioning. And this is the anxiety style. This comes courtesy of Harriet Lerner, who's a psychotherapist. She's brilliant. She has a lot of really great books and I'll give you a reference at the end today. One way is underfunctioning, And you might know some underfunctioners in your life. Underfunctioners tend to shut down when they get really anxious. And so I kind of call this uh, when we're not in our eyeballs anymore. You might have clients who, when they get really, really anxious about what's going on with a pet, all of a sudden they're not functioning appropriately. They're not able to make decisions. They get really quiet. They're not interacting. And so that's the underfunctioning spectrum. But I suspect most of the people in this call today, and this includes me too, are overfunctioners. Overfunctioners are like, if I'm anxious, I'm working harder because this is the key to getting control of this. And the challenge with overfunctioners and overfunctioning is that we end up taking on the work of others who are underfunctioning, which just makes us more anxious right? And so working harder doesn't make us feel less anxious. It actually makes us more overwhelmed. And the more clogged the circuits become, the busier those circuits become, the more likely we are to behave in such a way that actually makes our anxiety worse, okay? So what we need to learn how to do, folks, is pump the brakes. Managing anxiety means learning to use the, the built-in brake system in the body and this is what uh, we refer to as the vagus nerve. This is your brake system. The vagus nerve helps us to regulate the parasympathetic nervous system. It runs from deep within your brain through your face, through your thorax, and through your trunk and your lower abdomen, okay? And so the vagus nerve regulates our system. It's a really important part of the autonomic nervous system. And so when we are in ventral vagal, 
which is when you consider yourself sort of activated, you might be a little worried about what's going on, but you're not overly worried. So we're sort of really keyed up. It might be that we've sent a flood of adrenaline into the system. That's what the, the lower level anxiety might do. This means that we're engaging and we're connecting and we're trying to figure it out. We're still in problem solving mode. But I bet you can all put your finger on when you get overwhelmed. And that leads to what we call a dorsal vagal response, which is when we actually shut down and that pathway completely collapses. And so this is when people, again, aren't in their eyeballs or when they just can't function. It might be when you start to see overly anxious people who can't regulate, they start calling in sick right? So the vagus nerve, if we know that the vagus nerve is responsible for helping to regulate us, we can learn how to activate that through stimulation. It's not that we want to calm it down. We don't. We want to stimulate the vagus nerve because that helps us to regulate ourselves. And so this is not just an individual thing that we do. We also regulate alongside others, what we call conspecifics. And so being around support people is helpful. Being around calm others is helpful. So what we're going to talk about very quickly is how do we regulate anxiety? How do we stimulate the vagus nerve and do that both from the very base of the brain and that's managing anxiety from the bottom up? And then how do we regulate it from the midbrain? How do we regulate it from the top down? Okay, so managing from the bottom up, let's start with the physiological anxiety response. Okay, I want everybody to take a really good deep breath, your own pace. And then I want you to do what's called boxed or tactical breathing. Okay, so it's in breath through the nose to the count of four. Hold it to the count of four. Exhale through the mouth to the count of four. Hold it empty to the count of four. And then another really good deep breath. So four, 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 four. Four in, four hold, four out, four hold. This is called box or tactical breathing. So the vagus nerve really relies on the breath. Your breath is your built-in pause button. So for those of you who have had me and CE before, you've heard me say this. Use your breath intentionally to try to regulate your body so that it will send a signal to the higher brain that you don't need to be as worried right now, that you've got this. That's what the breath does. Another way to do this is called straw breathing. It's related to pranayama, which is yogic breathing. So this is also a counting mechanism. So straw breathing is when we breathe in through the nose, nice open breath, fill the chest, and then we hold it again for a couple of counts, and then we exhale very slowly, almost like we're wringing the lungs out like a towel. So for a breath to be really relaxed, what we need is um, to have the breath, the exhale be longer. And the longer the exhale and then the deeper the next inhale, the more relaxed you will become. So straw breathing, let's do that real quickly. And I might mute myself because I am sitting at my home office and I'm watching the FedEx guy get ready to come up my stairs. So let's do a straw breath and you can ignore the barks. Okay, so into the count of four through the nose, nice and deep. Hold it for two, and then exhale through a tiny hole between your lips as if through a straw through the count of six. And now, nice inhale, do it again. Into the count of four, nice and deep. Hold for two. Exhale to six. Good. So the more you repeat this pattern, either doing tactical breathing or straw breathing, the calmer your body will begin to feel. When we are super anxious, we need to do this for probably a prolonged series, five to 10 repetitions. Um, Either one of these is called pace breathing, where we are holding a pace and trying to regulate the physiology, okay? So try breath work first. This will send a message up to the higher brain telling you that this isn't as worrisome as you think. 
Okay, another way to do this, and you can do this in conjunction with breathing or breath work, is to use soothing touch. So the vagus nerve runs through your face, all of your facial muscles, runs through your neck, your torso, okay, through the thorax. And so what you can do is put a hand anywhere on your face, sometimes cupping your hands over your eyes and just holding the heat there for a little while can help. Okay, you can also put a hand on the back of your neck and either your chest or your belly as you're breathing and firm, settled, soothing touch actually also sends a message through that vagus nerve. It stimulates the vagus nerve and this can be tremendously useful to you. You can change your posture. So uh, one great way to stimulate the vagus nerve is to tense up the core muscles, imagining that there's a box of muscles between your lowest rib on each side and each hip bone. If you can tense up those muscles, really pull your navel to the spine and hold it, sometimes that's what you can do also with breathing. That also stimulates the vagus nerve. So again, what we're trying to do is send a message from the bottom up that we've got this and that we can start to settle ourselves, okay? Another thing to think about for regulating your base physiology is when we are in really anxious times, we tend to rely on chemicals that help us to get engaged or to disengage. The challenge with that is that it makes our signals scramble. So when we're super anxious, when I'm super anxious, I have to be very careful and I always advise my clients as well, reduce your consumption of alcohol, caffeine, and refined sugar, okay? All of this is really important for helping your body to regulate. And then what we need to do is focus on the midbrain. Again, the midbrain is where we have emotion and memory. And the challenge with memory, folks, is we have this incredibly complex system in our midbrain that is logging and cross-referencing every experience we've ever had. With the memory bank, it can confuse similar and same. And when we get anxious, those become shortcuts that are not useful because then as soon as we encounter something that's starting to raise our anxiety level, our brain is searching for similar situations and what has happened that can actually make us feel worse. And so what we need to be able to do is figure out what's going on in the body and raise the awareness of that because you're going to register anxiety in your body before it probably hits the higher brain centers. Okay, so the first thing I try to do to regulate that is to make it move. So we need to allow for some sort of discharge of that anxiety in the body. So if you can increase your heart rate and your respiratory rate for a purposeful reason, not because of your emotional state, but because I've decided I need to go for a quick brisk walk, I need to go for a jog, I need to do a couple of push-ups or a 60 second plank position just to get my blood pumping, that enables the emotion that's lodged in the muscles and that's sending an adrenaline rush through your body to settle down. It's giving it somewhere to go. So please try to make it move. The moment you feel something in your body that's starting to register, don't let it get overwhelming. Give it somewhere to go. Okay. Another thing you can do to manage it in the middle is to name it and tame it. So if we can get the higher brain, again, which is related to language, the lid is related to language. If we can get the higher brain to name what's happening and really nail down the processes, and it's more than just anxiety, usually anxiety is stemming with all other sorts of emotions, then we can tame it. We can come up with a strategy to manage it. What you see here, and it's, I know, very small font on your screen is what's called an emotion wheel. I encourage you all to Google it and look it up. So this emotion wheel at the sort of apex is going to, or at the center is going to center on all of sort of the key emotions. And then the offshoot is going to deal with all of the related ones. And so if you can put your finger on what's happening for you, especially when you're overwhelmed, because if we're overwhelmed, remember, we don't have access to our language, not in a good way. Giving ourselves a prompt helps jog the memory, helps us to identify what's happening, and then we can do something about it. So using an emotion wheel can help. It's not just that I'm anxious. It's that I'm also really feeling disengaged. It could be that I'm also really getting angry at the things I can't control. And if I can put my finger on that, I can do something with it. Okay. And then related to that, downloading the emotions with a witness. 
Some of you have heard me say this before, that we all need to have at least a couple of witnesses in our lives who can take a call from us or sit down with us at a moment's notice. And their job is to listen without giving feedback, because that's not what we're asking for. They're not supposed to solution build. They're supposed to not judge. They just need to hear it and help us to co-regulate. Okay, remember, co-regulation is part of what the vagus nerve enables us to do. So if we can sit with someone who's completely trustworthy, with whom nothing is off limits, and really download and discharge, and their job is to say, man, that's really hard, and what are you going to do? How are you going to help yourself? How are you going to manage what's happening in your life? I really believe in you, and I trust you. That is going to help us to figure it out. And in that process, we've been able to put words to it. So it helps us to manage the middle part of the brain's process. Okay. And then managing anxiety from the top down. Um, this means using the lid, which is, again, all of our sharpest tools, all of our higher neocortical tools are up here. And so one of the best ways to do this, folks, is reality checking. Many of you know Brene Brown. She has three questions that she asks herself, and actually I've adopted these myself as well. The first question when I'm really getting anxious is, do I have enough information right now to get freaked out about this? Chances are because of how complex the brain is and how um, the shortcuts in the memory bank work, I might be jumping the gun a bit and really freaking out about something simply because I'm starting to feel worried. But I might not have enough to really go and follow that all the way down to catastrophe level. So I need to be able to stop myself. So ask yourself, do I have enough information to freak out about it? Now the answer might be yes. It might be we should be freaking out right now. Then the second question is this, will freaking out about this help me? <laughs> because sometimes, most of the time, freaking out about it is not going to lead you through your best tools. It's not going to help you to discern what needs to happen. It's not going to help you to reason. It's not going to help you to collect more data. It's not going to help you to manage the emotional state and then manage your language so that you can negotiate your way through it. Okay. The third thing that's really important to ask yourself is what story am I telling myself about this and is it true? Again, reality check it. This is another thing that you can do with your witness or with a trusted coworker to be able to say, I am really telling myself that this is going to be awful and that everything about practice is going to completely unravel. I'm not sure if that's true. Or if I'm telling myself that I'm an utter failure because everything about today went down the toilet, that might not be true. Doesn't mean I'm not anxious about it, but I need to reality, reality check it just a bit, okay? So ask yourself those questions to try to get the reasoning back on board. Anxiety scrambles that. The second thing I want you all to do is to curb your doom scrolling and limit how much time you're spending on social media because what that does is it's adding more data into the neocortex and there is such a thing as too much information. There is such a thing as too much bad information. There is such a thing as too much gossip, too much comparison, and too much of the negative news cycle. So try to cut yourself down. If you can limit yourself to a little bit of the news checking in the morning and the evening, and then cut yourself off of um, social media at least one day a week, I would recommend it. And then last is limiting worry time. So worry can be useful because it can help us to problem solve, but not if we're doing it ad nauseum. So we have to be able to limit the amount of time we spend in that worrying sort of cycle. Remember, because that builds on itself and then at some point we can't get control of it anymore. So limit your worry time. Allow yourself the time and space to worry like it is an Olympic sport, but limit it to 10 to 15 minutes on the one source that is really causing you the most worry at this moment. And after that 10 to 15 minutes, I recommend set an alarm on your phone and then change the channel in your brain. You need to give yourself something else to focus on that has nothing to do with the source of your worry. So that answers a little bit of what, about what the brain is asking you to do, but it's not allowing you to over-engage it. So you have to give yourself guardrails, okay? So of all of these things, I want you to pick one out of each part of the brain and really commit to practicing it because the more practice you get at controlling anxiety, the better you will get at it.
right? The more we worry, the better we get at worrying. But if we can find a way to change the track of the brain and take it down a calmer, more balanced and centered path using vagus nerve stimulation, it's going to help us to feel better steadily over time. And then the vagus nerve will stimulate with less and less of a of a tweak, right? Less and less of a nudge because we're going to build that muscle. We're going to build the capacity to stimulate it on demand. So in the neocortex, it's reality checking, it's limiting your worry time, it's curbing consumption of social and other media. In the midbrain, I want you to move it and give it an outlet. I want you to be able to give it a witness and be able to name it to tame it. And then in the reptilian brain, Use breath work really intentionally. This is always the best place to start. Use calming touch because that grounds us and centers us. Engage your core muscles. Reduce your stimulants as well as the use of depressants. Okay, alcohol might make you feel better after the end of a really long and difficult day, but what that's going to do is it's going to set us up to need caffeine and sugars to fuel ourselves to get that going. And then we're going to be constantly toggling between those two. So really watch that intake. Your resources. Dr. Henry Emmons has a wonderful book for those of you who need something that's relatively easy to consume or even to listen to um, on Audible. So The Chemistry of Calm is a wonderful book by Henry Emmons, and he works through a lot of these kinds of recommendations. Dr. Amit Sud from the Mayo Clinic has a wonderful guide that I frequently reference in my trainings. And then Brene Brown has a wonderful podcast, and she recently did something on taming anxiety and what that means for over and under functioning. So I completely recommend that. Okay. And we are right at 2.30, so happy to take questions as we've got them. Awesome. Thanks so much, Janine. That was uh, awesome information and, uh, and uh, a lot of great feedback. And obviously, we talked about this in the beginning of the um, session, the YouTube live session today, what an appropriate time, which is why we're doing this because, um, you know, we, Justine and I talk about this ourselves. We're in the clinic as well. We're not technically just sitting behind a computer. We're in the trenches like everyone else. Um, and you know, our shifts, I can speak for myself, my shifts. They, have been they've really been horrible. <laughs> hmm? They've been horrible. Right. They're really hard. He said it. I, I was trying to be nicer. Yes. They've been horrible. <laughs> and, uh, Matthew, just Janine and I, right. As uh, Justine was uh, checking on earlier, we we're chatting about some of the challenges we're facing. And there's a lot of anxiety. I think if you break down a lot of what I was saying to Janine, what I face and I'm sure Jan, uh, Justine would agree on a daily basis in the ER is there's anxiety. There's anxiety on our side with the number of cases we're seeing. There's anxiety on the client side. Um, with a, a curbside check-in and the phone calls and not greeting and their pets going into the building. And so this clearly is an appropriate time to chat about this. Justine, I don't know if you have a few questions or, or comments that came across that would be good to check in with uh, Janine about. Sure. Well, first of all, Janine, thank you so much for doing that. I mean, honestly, it sounds silly, but we don't even have time to take a box no. breath right? We don't do that in the clinic. It takes five seconds to do or six seconds total. And we oftentimes just don't find a quiet place to be able to do that because we're nonstop busy. And I like how you explain most of us are probably over-functioning versus under-functioning. And, you know, between COVID, worrying about getting sick, having colleagues that test positive, wearing masks, trying to talk to clients, uh, trying to homeschool, trying to survive with a kid 24-7 or being with your partner 24 seven. I mean, you're just not meant to be there 24 seven. Um, just taking that deep breath is really, really helpful. Um, I saw a couple of great comments, people saying that's why they like their Fitbit app. Um, whether or not you even need to use technology, obviously Garrett and I are very pro technology. Calm, I know if you have an American Express card, just open up a year free subscription um, to people. It's worth the hundred bucks um, in case you don't um have that but it's worth it so um you know finding that quiet time whether or not it's just even a couple of breaths so i see a lot of people saying they're really stressed they're really burnt out um, if you guys have tips too please feel free to type them in uh one great comment that i saw is a lot of times people forget to be positive right we're all so busy right now taking the time to put something on the refrigerator at the clinic right nice comments or uh um that you hear from clients just taking the time to write it down um, Garrett or Janine, I don't know if you have any other tips, but um, those are the biggest ones that I see right now. Oh, we do see a question. 
Can you suggest something to limit self-doubt and improving decision making under pressure? Excellent question. Yeah. Um, this gets back to Brene Brown's questions um, on reality checking, right? So self-doubt is often related to fear. It's related to anxiety. It's, it fuels anxiety. So it's the fear that I'm not going to measure up, that I'm not going to be able to perform. Um, it's, it's the imposter syndrome, right? The fear that I'm a fraud, that someone, anybody's going to discover any moment now that I have no idea what I'm doing. So all of this sort of finds a way to scroll in the back of the brain. And here's where this is about the story I tell myself. And do I have enough data to tell me that it's actually true? Or is it just my fear talking? And I call that sort of the catastrophe choir or the catastrophe chorus that's sort of in the back of all of our heads. Sometimes it's sitting on the shoulder. Um, and so this is where, you know, we probably know better. We probably know that we're not complete and abject failures, although sometimes that's our biggest fear. Um, the self-doubt is coming from that core place. And so reality check the story. Limit how much time you allow yourself to engage that story. Here's where we give ourselves guardrails. It's really important. And then if you've got a friend, someone you really, really trust with whom you can have that honest conversation and go, I feel like a complete failure right now. This is awful. I don't think I can do this much longer. And have that person go, okay, I hear you. And remember that they probably wouldn't talk to you that way, right? You probably wouldn't talk to someone you trusted, loved, and respected in that way. And so be careful not to talk to yourself that way. That's another way to manage the anxiety around some of that fear and self-doubt. Excellent, great point. Um, I see a, a couple other questions. How can managers be more supportive for sa staff? Thank you, manager. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do? Um, folks, every time you huddle, every time you're sitting down to give feedback, every time someone comes to you and they're melting down, as I said, they're not in their eyeballs, right? <laughs> you all know what that looks like when it faces you. Sit down and ask them to breathe. Everybody take a breath. Um, if we can train that into ourselves so that we can start getting back into the fullness of our brain and our bodies, that will help us to ground and it helps us to pay attention fully in the moment and to settle some of the emotional angst that is cropping up at a time like this. If you do nothing else, you can do that. And breathing doesn't have to take loads of time. As Justine said, it can take four seconds in. It's 16 seconds to do a box breath. That's all it is. And you've got 16 seconds. So teach that to your staff. I, I uh, am a really loud sire. Like I go, <sighs> <sighs> I didn't, I wasn't cognizant of how loud I was sighing and someone in a separate office said to me, are you okay from around the hall? And I was just like, that's just the way that I'm like alleviating my stress. Mm -hmm. um, so just run to the bathroom. I know it sounds crazy. I mean, we don't even get a lunch break to, you know, in right. the ER. And so we don't think we have that time to do that, but really, really important. Yeah. Um, someone else commented, I had brought up the Calm app before. Another great resource is the Headspace app for mindful mm -hmm. meditation. And, you know, honestly, mm -hmm. YouTube, you can find a mm -hmm. lot of great meditation um, videos yep. and you don't have to look at it. It's distracting. You could just play it, right? So um, look, there's a ton of free content out there that's free. Um, another comment, I know you already brought up some resources, Garrett, maybe you can bring it back to that page, to that PowerPoint. Uh, one comment from Olivia, I'm trying to help my large hospital with wellness and mental health. Any tips on how to get more feedback from people on what they would like information on or any resources to look at, especially in our vet field when people are introverted and don't necessarily want to admit to needing mental health or wellness support? Yeah. Um, so the AVMA has compiled and continues to update on their well-being page all sorts of resources around all of the elements of wellness, all seven of them. Um, so they have some great resources. I'm seeing more and more state VMAs also really start to put time, energy, and resources into providing these kinds of things for um, the veterinary community in their state. And I know more and more of them are approving CE having to do with well-being, which hasn't always been the case, right? Not everybody gets approval in their states for this kind of content. Um, and I think what we can assume, if we need each other in a place of humanity and shared humanity, is we can assume that most people could benefit from information on managing anxiety, um, how to manage being a working parent, 
which is a huge part of the experience for most of us. Um, most of us need help managing just day-to-day -day stress and developing some of the skills and the tools around um, just how do we keep ourselves, I saw this in the chat, how can I think through what's happening for me and make good sound decisions when everything around me is melting down? I had um, a team last week describe their practice for me and they said every day feels like a dumpster fire. <laughs> and so learning flexibility skills, adaptability skills, and sort of learning what a resilience mindset is can really help. And those are all good places to start. Mindfulness helps with all of those things. So as Justine said, headspace is great. So is calm. Um, so is Insight Timer, which is free and has loads and loads of free content on just about everything related to mindful practice. So those are all really good places to start. All right, thank you. Um, is there a way to train ourselves to be more resilient? Yes, resilience is a muscle, and yes. So um, what we know about resilience is uh, a good chunk of resilience as a general skill is inherited. Some of it is socially created and um, so we all have a set point for resilience. The great news though, is that we have neuroplasticity, which means that the brain is constantly evolving, changing and strengthening certain networks over other networks. Neuroplasticity makes resilience possible. So even if your natural set point isn't super resilient, it doesn't mean you can't get there. So part of what we were talking about today with anxiety management skills is related to resilience. Um, anything that we can do to build your cognitive and emotional capacity and also the physiological capacity to manage your parasympathetic response will help you build resilience. All right, thank you. Um, we know everyone's time is really valuable and we know everyone's really busy. So mm -hmm. we just wanted to end it here. Uh, but if you have any feedback, please feel free to type it in. Um, a lot of great feedback. So thank you, Janine, for doing that. And remember, this one does not have race CE associated with it. This was just for learning for self-care. Uh, but we promise to continue to try to do a couple of YouTube live events um, throughout the year. And again, we hardly ever get the thank yous. We hardly ever get the pats on the back. Um, you guys are essential. You guys are rocking it. Um, stay safe. And thank you for all that you do, whether or not it's you know, in industry, private practice, emergency practice, working weekends, working nights, whatever you're doing. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for parenting, being a good partner, being a good colleague. Um, stay positive. And when in doubt, um, make sure to share this uh, for those who need some anxiety breaks or some life hacks. And with that, be safe. Thank you, everyone. Take Thanks care, so everybody. Thanks, Janine. That was great. Thank you.